Larry, are you are you buying the Gilstrap story here that he's going to go bankrupt by shipping these books to people? Absolutely. I think John is a wonderful fellow. <laughs> I think you should be in studio. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in the studio. I'm afraid I get a big sloppy kiss. <laughs> well, that's a fear we haven't heard expressed before in this program. However, it's probably a relevant fear, considering the way Bill greets people when they come in. <laughs> yeah, all right. Lair, how's the weather in Charleston? Uh, did you get much of the weekend winter storm? We got nothing but rain. And I, uh, in fact, there was so much snow in the Falling Waters area that we church, they closed our church on Sunday. So I went to church down here. I was probably the only one from our area went to church on Sunday from our from my faith. I think you get bonus points for that, don't you? I think so. I think I get a gold star in my crown. All right. That's going to count toward the end. Uh, whether or yes, not you shipped a free book to somebody <laughs> and if you made it to church when everyone else <laughs> bailed. Uh, That's right. Absolutely. Same issue. Uh, Larry, I presume everybody is in place now in Charleston. Has pretty much everybody arrived? Pretty much. Uh, if there's someone hasn't made it, uh, I, I'm not aware of it. But uh, we we all are down here. I think pretty much. What's the? What did you have a meeting Sunday, or is your first thing on the schedule today? I don't go I mean, because of my faith. I don't do Sunday meetings. But I've got uh, we've got a big caucus today at noon, and then I got two interim committee meetings on Tuesday. One on the uh, judiciary committee, and one on the pensions committee, and then. Uh, Wednesday morning, we start to show off for good. You are going to be party to a bill that will request single-member Senate districts in the state, Larry? Yes, I'm, yes, I am. Uh, I've put in the bill before and gotten some, some interest, uh, but didn't really push it. But I was at a meeting, oh, a week or so ago <clears throat> of a group, and uh, former delegate John uh, Overton said, you know, we ought to have single member Senate districts. And I said, well, you know, I'll put the bill in again and see what, see what we go with it. Uh, for years and years and years, we've had single member delegate districts in the Eastern Panhandle, which has not been the case throughout the state. For instance, down in Kanawha County, the state capital, they've had as many as 10 delegates in the district. And just several years ago, they created single member House of Delegates districts throughout the state, which has worked really, really well. Uh, and now I think it's time to drop the other shoe and have single member Senate districts, which would not uh, increase or decrease the number of senators, but it would uh, cut the number of people in their districts down to, to one half of what they are now, giving more people more of a more of a voice with their state senator. Larry, does this require a constitutional change? Yes, it does, and that makes it a, a heavy lift. Uh, it, a constitutional change, because the Constitution currently says two senators per district uh, with a proviso that you can't have more than one senator from, from, uh, 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 from the same county. Uh, so it would require a constitutional change, which means it requires a two-thirds vote of the legislature, and then after that it goes in the next general election for a referendum, a majority referendum for the voters. Larry, you said that you've talked about this before. What has been the objection to it? There really wasn't any objection to it before. Uh, I put in the bill uh, just, you know, to kind of glean some 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 ideas on it, and uh, I, I hadn't got any any objection on it. Uh, it just didn't go anywhere. It just wasn't a big priority issue for me or anyone else. It was just an idea that was floating around in my head, and I thought it was a good one. I still do. Now I'm going to push it a little more. Do you have any co-sponsors? Uh not yet, because the drafting hasn't been done on it yet. Uh, well, now I take that back. Uh, the drafting has been down, but now the lead delegators or delegates are down here. I'm going to be shopping around for co-sponsors. Bill. Yeah, I I guess something's broke here, uh, Larry. I'm not sure that it is, at least in my mind. But I uh, um, I would think there's going to be more pressing issues than uh, trying to discuss going down to uh, single-party Senate districts, but I could be wrong on that. So. Hey, uh, Larry, a couple other things. What uh, Besides the single-issue district, uh, I'm hearing some talk that Senator Blair is going to propose a uh, uh, capital punishment being reinstituted in the state for, for drug dealers, uh, a, death, a death penalty. Uh, do you have any sense at all for that? Because I know you're a very religious individual. Yeah, I, I've, I've, uh, number one, uh, drug uh, 
uh, drugs are a big problem in West Virginia. I'm certainly on board on doing, doing more about, about drug offenses. Among other things, one of the bills I'm putting in this year, and I've got a numerous co-sponsors, and the Speaker of the House said he thought it was a good idea, too, to have random drug testing of legislators. Uh, if we're going to be pushing this drug issue, I think we ought to set an example. Now, as far as the death penalty on uh, – on uh, on drug offenders for drug distribution, uh, big time drug distributors. Uh, my issue on that is let's uh, let's let's look at the statute. Uh, I think, for instance, among other things, that ought to be a non non parole sentence, uh, and we need to put that in the legislature to make those type of things non parole. But as far as taking somebody's life for any reason. Uh, I just – I am absolutely opposed, and I think it will be a hard push to get it through the legislature uh, to, to put through a death penalty uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, I worked in prison, the prison system for 17 years, and I know from personal and academic and other experience that death penalties are not a deterrent. Uh, people are going to do what they're going to do. Number two, a death penalty – uh, because of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution for unusual punishment, uh, to have a death penalty on any case, uh, it uh, it actually costs less to incarcerate somebody for life than it does to execute them because of all the court appeals. Uh, and then there's the Wolf's factor. What if you what if you execute somebody uh, and uh, and they find out afterwards that uh, the evidence evidence was flawed and they made a mistake? You can't take somebody's life. And and finally. I'm pro-life all the way from birth and to death. I just don't believe that we ought to have civil authority to take somebody's life. Fair enough. Thank you, John. Thank you, Larry. Mr. Gilstrap. I want to go back to this idea of drug testing legislators. Um, okay. And it's kind of maybe a several-part question. First of all, um, why? Why would we, what, a hypothetical, let's say that um, what a legislator X goes to, uh, spends a weekend in a state where marijuana is perfectly legal, and then they come back, that stuff stays in your blood system for weeks, and then they test positive for having done a legal thing uh, a week ago. Why is, why is that important for us to know? Well, drug testing is not just for marijuana. I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, at the harder uh, the harder drug sentences uh, and random drug testing for for legislators would just indicate whether somebody a legislator uh, uh, is under the influence of, of, of some court of drug. It wouldn't be in a penalty, but it would be public information. Uh, and I think that the general public needs to know uh, if the legislators uh, are on drugs. Okay, let's. I, this is something that is always kind of baffled me. Back when I was in um, the, the private sector doing uh, real jobs, I was a safety engineer and we had a lot of clients who's, who that ran scrap yards and they had their employees who would test positive for marijuana and they'd have to fire them. They're otherwise, they're not intoxicated at the job, but th they had these draconian mm -hmm. rules that said, well, now we have to fire a good worker. And I used to say, well, get rid of the drug regulation. You know, they're not they don't have to drive, you know, it's the fact that some, mm -hmm. that there are traces in the blood does not necessarily mean that people are, are impaired, but. Well, you know, that, that, that's an interesting point. It, it jogs a memory. Some years ago, one of the lobbyists um, from one of the uh, electric companies was talking to a group of us and uh, said that they had uh, uh, 50 applicants for a lineman job and a lineman job with an electric company pays pretty good money. And they told us that only two of them uh, failed to uh, pass the, the drug test, which I thought was just 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 awful. Uh, so private sector uh, companies do do uh, random drug testing. Some do mandatory drug testing. I think it's only fair uh, that legislators also be subject to random drug tests. Larry, you mentioned uh, we mentioned two things: capital punishment, a single member Senate district. Is there another issue or another one or two issues that you're following and you'd love to see pass this, this session? Well, more than one or two. I'm, I've, I am co or not co sponsoring. I am sponsoring. I'm going to co sponsor a lot of bills, but I'm sponsoring over 30 bills this year. Uh, one of the bills that, uh, that uh, I, uh, a couple of them I'll mention, one is uh, a vehicular homicide. Under West Virginia law, the, if, if you. Run over somebody and kill them. 
whether you're under the influence or whether you're just reckless driving, uh, the, the fine uh, and imprisonment is very, mayor, very mayor, much de minimis. Uh, so uh, I've got a bill that's going to elevate the uh, punishment for vehicular uh, uh, homicide. Also, uh, we have a problem. I've got a lot of feedback from constituents about out-of-state tags in West Virginia. And so I've got a bill that's, that says if you, if you move into West Virginia and you've lived here over 90 days, that there's going to be a fine for you not having uh, out-of-state tags. Uh, I, a bill I'm putting in again this year is to change school board elections uh, from primary to general election to get more voter turnout, more voter uh, uh, awareness of what's going on. And then finally, uh, well, not finally, but one of the other bills I'm going to be putting in is to remove the parole status for child abusers. Okay. Larry, could we can go back to the vehicular homicide. Have you been working with Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey on that at all? I haven't been working with, with him, but it come, uh, it came from a, con, uh, area, a fellow from uh, um, Berkeley County, uh, Georgia, Martin Check, uh, who's had a terrible situation where his wife was killed by a, uh, by a reckless driver, and the person who did that really didn't get much more than a rap on the knuckles. Uh, a couple of days ago, I got another letter from a person who had a similar situation. We have had the legal staff of the uh, – House of Delegates uh, Judiciary Committee looking on that, and uh, we've got a bill that uh, I think is a fair bill, but uh, uh, creates homicide uh, as a vehicle uh, much more seriously with the way they do it now. Larry, your school board are going to uh, moving from May until November. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. There was some talk a year or so ago about making the school board a partisan election. Uh, is that which I think I I hope that does not happen. Are, is that still being talked about some? The uh, the non the, the bringing the school board back to to a, uh, to a partisan status is a separate issue from my bill about the election. However, I think that bill is going to come back. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that it's going to go anywhere, but uh, I'm sure that that's going to be reinduced again. Tomorrow, not tomorrow, Wednesday, is the first day that bills can uh, uh, be, be introduced. And every year, and this is good for the public to know as well, there's about two or 3,000 bills introduced. Less than 300, a little over 200, actually are passed, uh, passed and signed into law. So uh, the number of bills introduced doesn't necessarily equate to the number of bills that are passed. So this year, there's nothing. Last year, we were waiting for um, there was the income tax cut, and there was the uh, personal property tax. They're like big overarching issues that uh, kind of sucked up all the air in the room. Are there any such issues in the legislator legislature this session? The firefighters one has got to still be on the on the. Uh... The firefighters thing is is, is still come is going to come up. That was a big issue last year. It's an ongoing issue. The problem I have with the, the, the firefighters is raising a tax. I'm just opposed to 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 ra to, uh, to 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 ra raising raising a, a tax. Uh, the, but the big issue I have is that counties have the authority to increase those fees, as Berkeley County has done. Uh, but the proposal is being floated around is increasing the the, the fee uh, the fees uh, for for firefighters, which certainly is a worthy cause. But some counties uh, have absolutely refused to enact any kind of uh, fire ambulance fee, and I don't think those counties ought to be get the benefit of leg legislative uh, raising of the of the, uh, the 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 taxes on. Uh, on, on that issues, but that that bill will be will be coming around again. And there was another question that was asked, and I forgot what it was. Uh, so who are asked is going to have to refresh me. I, I'll, I'll ask you one about the committees that you're on, uh, Larry, if you could, and that's judiciary being uh, one of those. Yeah, judiciary and pensions, and judiciary is one of the major committees. Uh, yeah, you don't have a chairperson right now. Don't have a chairperson, and it's interesting. Uh, uh, the speaker's probably already made up his mind by now, but I haven't been privy to that decision. Uh, the the chairman, uh, Delegate Moore Capito, has uh, resigned in order to run for uh, spend more time running for governor. We have a vice chair, Tom Fast, uh, who would 
under most circumstances be be eligible to be elevated to chair. But another person is being introduced uh, or, or considered as Brandon Steele. So I don't know which one of those is going to be named chair. Uh, and of course, whoever's named chair. Uh, then we still have to have the the vice chair, uh, unless Brandon Steele's put in. I guess Tom Fass would stay vice chair. But uh, that, that's oh, Tom, the other question I was asking about other big issues that are that are going on. Uh, one is corrections. We still have ongoing issues with corrections, and the other is the child protective service workers uh, and what's going on with that. We have a real problem that that's ongoing. We took a bite of that. Uh, we took a bite of that uh, with uh, correctional. Uh, uh, correctional facilities, but there's still a lot more work to be done. Yeah. Larry, uh, you mentioned uh, changing the role status of child abusers. Would you speak to that a second? Yeah, my bill uh, currently, uh, if you're if you're convicted for child abuse, uh, uh, regardless of the length of the sentence, you're eligible for parole. My experience as a criminal uh, justice case manager with child abusers uh, is that they, they really don't get better. And the purpose of prison is not to punish somebody. It's not necessarily to rehabilitate them, but that's a plus if that can be done. The purpose of prison is to keep a dangerous person away from the public. Child abusers are always dangerous. And to parole a child abuser, I just think, is is a real, real mistake. They ought to serve their full sentence minus whatever good time they've earned. I've, I've had situations where I've done release paperwork for a child abuser where the child abuser literally walked out of the prison gates and said gleefully little kitties here i come uh in that particular instance that fellow was arrested again uh several months after his release snatching a child out of somebody's yard why not, why not just give them mandatory life sentences well that that that's a that's a uh that, that's another issue and and one that uh one that I would not necessarily be adverse to, but uh, I think getting non-parole would be a step that uh, would at least be a, a step in the positive direction. Uh, one of the things I did in the past, in addition to my prison work, is I worked as a uh, group therapist for a group of people, among which were child abusers. And, uh, you know, it's really sad. I got a perspective of that that I didn't have before. I always thought child abuse was a horrible, horrible, horrible crime, and it is. But talking to the people that actually abused them, some of the agony and self-loathing they had for what they did. In fact, I had one fella on my caseload that was from the local area uh, across the river in Boonesboro, Maryland, that, and I can speak to him somewhat now because he's dead, uh, that had multiple child abuse sentences. He liked young boys. He would groom young boys and abuse them. Uh, five-year sentences, multiple sentences that actually became a life sentence, consecutive sentences. And he sat in my office one day in tears saying, I'm in the best place I can be because I'm away from my victim pool. And he says, but I'm really, really worried that when I die and I'm judged uh, for the hereafter, I'm going to go to hell forever because I'm such a terrible person. And I, it, my heart really went out to that fellow who had an emotional illness and couldn't deal with it. You mentioned a couple minutes ago that uh, uh, child protective service something will require will get some attention, but yet DHHR was reorganized uh, this past year. It's still in the process of being reorganized. Uh, do you do you anticipate child protective service is still going to have a major problem, or should that not be addressed? Hopefully, by the reorganization of DHHR. Uh, I, 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 th I think we have an ongoing problem with Child Protective Services. The reorganization of the Department of Health and Human Resources, I voted for it, but I, you know, and the agency was a huge agency, uh, and if they wanted to downsize it and make three agencies, that's fine, but I don't know that that necessarily makes any changes in the agency. Hope so, but I don't know. Uh, but among the things that are wrong uh, and ongoing as a wrong is these children that have no parents uh, and are being taken care of by Child Protective Services, and they're understaffed. The, the employees are. They're underpaid. The attorneys who the the, the ad litem uh, attorneys that that represent these these people are underpaid. And but more importantly, these children are really hurting, and we need. 
to pay much more attention uh, to these to this issue and to do more for them. Larry, my uh, source in Charleston, Mike Hornby, uh, as in delegate, tells me that uh, Tom Fast will be the new chair and David Kelly will be the vice chair. Well, of, that's of good. Judiciary. I know Tom Fast real, real, uh, real well, and he's a really, really good man. Uh, so, uh, and I know Dave Kelly well too. Uh, he's he's uh, currently the chair of the uh, prisons and, uh, uh, and and jails committee. So. That's, those are good choices. Larry, also I'm told that there is uh, likely to be a 5% uh, across-the-board raise for state employees this year, and it is also likely that the 10% income tax cut will meet all the math requirements and kick in. Both of those have a price tag of around $200 million. Currently, the state's surplus for the first half of the year is at $400 million on pace to exceed $800 million for the year. Your thoughts? Yeah, uh, on the... Um a reduction of the state per, uh, the state income tax, uh, per, uh, that will not be a legislative agenda, agenda because that's set in the in the in the current law that that's just a formula based on on the, on the surplus. So th- that that's a given, and there's not going to be uh, any legislative dis- discussion on that. But as far as the uh, the state employee raise, and of course that's a proposal. I, I think the governor's going to propose that in the state of the state of the state. Uh, address Wednesday night, and the Senate and House leadership are are for that. Uh, quite frankly, <clears throat> state employees are still grossly underpaid, and that just helps them tread water. It really doesn't help in any case. But that does take a big chunk out of the, out of the surplus. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, we've got to take care of uh, of those who do the work for 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 the state. And we also need to send as much money back as possible to the taxpayers that are funding this whole operation. Any final thoughts as the 60-day session is about to begin, Larry? Well, uh, the one one thing, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, uh, one of the bills that I've, I've put, up, put in, uh, we still have these uh, people that move in from out of state uh, that don't get their license tags. So I've got Bill in to, uh, to have some fines for those. I think I did mention that, but... Uh, and then the other issue, uh, well, there's 25 or, th- or 26 or seven other issues, and time doesn't permit me to go into all of them. So we'll see what happens. Larry, how much of a fine are you proposing for somebody who has out-of-state tags after they've already relocated here? I'd have to look in, at the bill. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, it's a substantial substantial fine, I think a couple hundred dollars, because you want to get their, their attention uh, it's just just laziness. I, I I don't know how many times, for instance, in the Marlowe area, if you drive by their school any given morning, you'll see cars, people dropping off kids or or picking them up after school, and there's more out-of-state tags uh, from Maryland than anything else. And it's just really a thorn in the side to the, the taxpayers because these people aren't paying their their their, their share of li- license fees. Uh, so that that's a big deal, and I'm hopeful that we can – do something positive about that. Can you get fined multiple times for it? Is there a time period where I, I got fined on Monday on my way to the school to drop my kid off? I got fined again on my way home picking the kid up from school. How often can you get fined for it? I don't think that you could be multiply fined on that the way the bill's provided, but if you had more than one vehicle and each vehicle was doing that, uh, there's a possibility you could be fined uh, uh, fined on, on both vehicles if you're caught on both vehicles. But uh, what we're trying to do here, or what I'm trying to do, is to, if you live in West Virginia, you know, get your state tags. Uh, it's just it's just that simple. If you get those state tags, then you shouldn't have a problem. I had a neighbor that uh, for 20 years had uh, out-of-state tags from Maryland, and their argument was, well, I have I have property owned in Maryland. Well, that, you know, that's, that's not a valid reason. Their residence was in West Virginia. One other thing I might mention, for other information on what I'm going on with with the legislature, uh, my website is Larry Kump, L-A-R-R-Y-K-U-M-P dot com. So uh, keep abreast of that, and uh, you'll get much more information, maybe more than you want. Thanks, Larry. Have a great Thank day. You. Thank you, Larry. You too. And for sure and for certain, may God bless you all real good. Thank you, sir.